Why do the US military and the local law enforcement each have their police squads? Is there a big gap between them? Do they play by the same rule book? Can they both slap on the handcuffs? And hey, what's the lowdown on their training? Is it a carbon copy? Plus, who's got the front row seat to more action? In every sector, be it the military or law enforcement, addressing misconduct is a shared challenge for society. Before we dive into the nitty gritty differences, let's get the lowdown on what these squads are all about. First, meet the MPs, military police, the heroes scattered across every branch of the military, except for the Space Force. You've got the Army MPs, Navy Master at Arms, Marine MPs, Air Force Security Forces, and Coast Guard Maritime Enforcement Specialists. While they may sport different titles, they're all cut from the same cloth. Military police tasked with maintaining order. MPs enforce the law on military turf, handling everything from base security to patrols, and sometimes even stepping into the fray during combat overseas. On the flip side, regular police are the civilian warriors of law enforcement. They're not part of the military, even if they find themselves policing on military bases. These folks are the enforcers covering the legal spectrum from federal to city levels, ensuring peace across the United States based on their specific jurisdiction. When we talk about regular police, we're keeping it simple referring to your everyday cops. Law enforcement wears many hats, but let's talk about the standard patrol officer. They're the ones cruising around, responding to incidents and emergencies, and safeguarding public safety. Military police, as the name suggests, are the police force within the military, while regular police operate outside the military. Now, there are lots of overlap in their day-to-day -day tasks. Law enforcement is law enforcement, after all. Don't be caught off guard if you spot an MP conducting a field sobriety test for a service member on base, much like a patrol officer would do for a drunk driver on any regular highway. Take a stroll into a military base and you'll see MPs patrolling just like your local town cop in your neighborhood. Military bases are like mini cities, schools, housing, bars, grocery stores, you name it, with people coming and going. Crime happens even in these military microcosms and MPs respond to similar calls as your town cop. Domestic violence, DUIs, burglary, theft, active shooters, and yes, they can even work undercover. Now, about action. Do they see the same amount? No. On average, your typical law enforcement officer responds to a higher frequency of calls than an MP while patrolling a base. MPs only have jurisdiction on military installations. Once they step outside those gates, they're in the territory of the local police department. What else sets MPs and civilian police apart? Well, MPs enforce the Uniform Code of Military Justice, the military's rulebook set by Congress. It's federal law, and if you're in the military, you're under its thumb. Essentially, if you're a service member misbehaving on a military base, the UCMG has its eyes on you. Getting arrested for violating the UCMG isn't a walk in the park. It's not just about the UCMG, though. Any crime can land you in hot water. If you're a civilian on a military base, you won't face the UCMG like a service member would. You won't get a free pass for speeding on a military base just because you're a civilian. Much like a regular cop on the highway, an MP can slap you with a speeding ticket on base. Military police have way less power and jurisdiction over civilians. The Posse Comitatus Act restricts federal troops, including MPs, from diving into civilian law enforcement, unless it's a do-or-die situation or under martial law. Even with civilians on a military base, MPs can only flex a specific amount of authority. The PCA doesn't boss around the Coast Guard. They have their rulebook for civilians. National Guard MPs can sometimes join the law enforcement game if it aligns with state law and official orders. While cops and MPs might cover similar ground, their training and career paths are quite distinct. Sure, they grasp some of the same basics when it comes to enforcing law, but you won't catch an MP walking into a police department to swap badges and vice versa. MPs are bound by a military contract and will always fulfill the service member duty first. On the flip side, cops are regular employees with a full-time gig. That means the cop can clock out anytime they please, but it's not that breezy for an MP to call it a day. Plus, cops can break in overtime, while MPs can't catch that extra paycheck. Now, how you become an MP or cop follows divergent paths. For MPs, it starts with boot camp, not exactly related to the job ahead. Remember, MPs are soldiers first, MPs second. Career progression also takes a different route. A patrol officer can cruise in that role for decades, retire in peace, or jump into detective work, take the sergeant's exam, or climb the ranks. In the military, it's climbing the ranks or exiting. The higher you go, the less you're on the front lines. Forget patrolling for a decade plus like a cop can. 
And speaking of climbing ranks, MPs are expected to shovel around much more than your typical car. With military bases scattered worldwide, MPs can find themselves anywhere, from your backyard to a base overseas. Cops, unlike MPs, tend to stick closer to home. While federal and state cops might find themselves relocating, or in a few cases deploying overseas, most cops remain rooted in their local communities. Now, let's shift gears and explore a compelling aspect that distinguishes the US military from civilian law enforcement. The matter of accountability. Back in the day, many US military members publicly distanced themselves from President Trump's decision to pardon Edward Gallagher, a former SEAL commando convicted of war crimes, including killing a teenage detainee in Iraq. This stark disapproval of a fellow service member's actions, even by those within the military ranks, highlights a crucial aspect. The military's commitment to holding its members accountable for wrongdoing. Edward Gallagher's case was met with widespread condemnation of the chain of command, with even his SEAL colleagues reporting his actions. This emphasis on organizational loyalty, putting the good of the institution before the individual, is deeply embedded in military culture. It stands in stark contrast to the blue wall of silence prevalent in US police culture, where officers often close ranks and refrain from reporting misconduct within their ranks. When police officers are involved in controversial incidents, such as the use of excessive force, there's often a tendency to defend these actions rather than report them. The so-called blue wall of silence discourages officers from speaking out against their colleagues and can lead to ostracization and denial of promotion to those who do. This cultural difference in the military and the police in handling internal conduct raises intriguing questions about their divergent attitudes towards accountability. In the military, the focus on organizational loyalty is deeply rooted in the training and ethos of service members. The Uniform Code of Military Justice underscores individual accountability. Military personnel are taught to prioritize the good of the institution over personal relationships, fostering a culture where reporting misconduct is not only accepted, but often considered a duty. Understanding these divergent attitudes provides a unique ethical framework within the US military. The distinction in attitudes towards accountability between the military and the police extends to the very nature of their internal justice systems. In the 1991 case, US versus Kinder, a military court declared a soldier is a reasoning agent, emphasizing that blindly following orders is not a requirement. The court held that a soldier should not follow obvious illegal orders and highlighted the fallacy that a soldier must unquestionably obey every command, referencing the Nuremberg trials as a cautionary example. This stands in sharp contrast to the often pervasive blue wall of silence in police departments, where officers might hesitate to report misconduct for fears of retaliation or damage to their careers. The military's emphasis on individual responsibility and the duty to report illegal orders contributes to a culture less prone to the kind of groupthink that can shield wrongdoing. While the military has not been immune to covering up atrocities, such as the My Lai massacre in Vietnam and the abuses in Abu Ghraib prison in Iraq, there is a fundamental difference in the military's approach to internal accountability. Deeply ingrained military ethics make service members wary of collective silence, setting them apart from the often closed ranks of police departments. The military's internal justice system also reflects its commitment to accountability. The Department of Defense operates its criminal justice system, a unique privilege that sets it apart. Though the civilian judiciary has been skeptical of military courts in the past, significant structural changes were made to strengthen the due process. Today, military judicial proceedings are designed to be free from political interference, ensuring that justice is served independently, even when it involves serious allegations like murder. This provides a stark contrast to the challenges faced by the police, contributing to the different attitudes towards accountability within these two armed forces. What are your thoughts on this? Let us know in the comments below. Thank you for watching, and until next time, goodbye.